With classifying climates, we also now move to talking about climate change, both a long-term and more recent sense. So we're going to be focusing on one of the important aspects that we see actually with this uh, image behind uh, our starting slide here of Antarctica and why that's so important, especially for longer term, helping us understand how climate has changed over a long, long periods of Earth's history. And so you know, in that vein, our song for to, to get us in the mood for this video is 100 Years by Five for Fighting, although really we're going to be going much further back uh, to start off this video than 100 years. We're going to be talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of years um, into Earth's past, I'm trying to understand from that, um, and specifically as we move into the next slide, you know, from different types of evidence, from what we call proxy data, um, how Earth's climate has changed over time. So we're going to be really, especially in this long, you know, uh, past history, even really prior to humans, history of trying to understand how Earth's climate have changed in the far distant past, if we think of that in the sense of over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years before present. Um, you know, the, the types of evidence uh, in terms of kind of when we move from that scale down to more hundreds of years ago or less, um, you know, kind of vary. So when we're dealing with more recent times in, in that sense of hundreds of years ago or less, you know, we might be able to, to, to rely on things as we have noted in the slide of things like diaries, logs, you know, legends, even potentially, you know, crop yields, art, all actually in ways can help us at least get pieced together almost like a little puzzle. It's usually missing some pieces, but, um, you know, that gives us some sort of understanding of what climate may have been like in the past. Um, and we also, through geologic formations, through glacial features, um, and, and kind of their own distribution through rock features, um, and, and other physical proxies and measuring things like isotopes in uh, rocks and or uh, ice cores or ocean sediment, all these things, even biological proxies, things like pollen or coral or tree rings, um, all can kind of add different pieces to this in puzzle that you know we're really never we never really, really will fully have to understand exactly what past climates were like but at least can give us good analogs of what that's like and so just showing some examples of that on the slides on the right hand side top upper right there kind of been zoomed in with a microscope of some pollen um, you know, that can be analyzed you know that can be used to understand well where was veget different vegetation types um, you know over long periods ago and that might tell us what to, of course if we know what was growing there we have some sort of understanding of what the, that climate might have been like and similarly the the climate or the the pollen diagram here on the bottom uh, showing different you know that you can once you measure those pollen types for example you could understand the distribution of species and how they change over time and again that gives you some instance just in one little way perhaps of how climates have shifted over long periods of time. And so we've used that to come to something like as shown here, um, where we construct some sort of temperature of planet Earth um, going really from starting at the on the right hand side at present, if we're moving on our horizontal axis here. And as you move further and further left, you go further and further back in time. And so note this kind of, the scale's kind of broken up into strange ways. You know, here this first part it's just in thousands of years before present, so zero and going back up to 1,000 years, or what would be 1,000 1, 1, years, which of course would be 1 million years, and then we shift to the scale of being in millions of years before present as you go further back here. Um, this is kind of also broken up based on different types of proxies we have um, that are you know, give us a different um, types of measurements and you know, understandings of these different past climates here. And so really we're going to be starting back uh, we're not going to really be going much further back in about 60, 70 million years uh, before present. Um, any further back than that for, for our purposes is less relevant and also the proxies get uh, you know a lot more uncertain generally as we just continue to go further and further back in terms of trying to understand uh, long, long-term climates. So we're going to be starting about that 60, 70 million, 70 million years ago and kind of then you know, thinking of this in this very long term scale. So again, you know, I'm, I'm saying when I say that hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years, and then we'll gradually kind of pare that down and get closer and closer and closer to present time in smaller and smaller uh, you know, time increments uh, as we move forward. But when we're talking about these long-term uh, 
changes in climate, um, there's a few main climate feedbacks and actually some processes that are also tied to that, or kind of causes are, that are tied to that. So we start with actually some of the, the main climate feedbacks that, are, that can be really important for uh, these longer term changes of climate. Um, one of the two, uh, the, the main ones that we'll focus on here is known as the ice albedo feedback. And so um, this feedback is a positive feedback. Actually, I didn't really introduce that as a term so far in this class, but essentially the idea is that you know, it induces um, whatever this, this feedback is, in this case, or in this process, to continually act uh, in, a, in a greater capacity, uh, basically because it reinforces itself occurring. So kind of it's shown on the right-hand side here. You know, we can think with our, we talked about uh, albedo, and if, you know, we know a little bit about ice, and we know it's you know, white, um, you know, it, its surface essentially reflects a lot of light off it. So we can think of that if we have increases in surface temperature, if ice melts, that reveals generally darker surfaces, whether that's just water or land below it. You know, that, that darker surface will, uh, of course, absorb more light, uh, incoming solar radiation than reflecting it like the ice did. That, you know, of course, will essentially then increase that temperature even more, increase it faster. Um, and, you know, then so essentially we're getting a positive feedback on itself for that even warmer temperature now melts more ice and it continues to go around in that kind of positive feedback circle. Um, and so this produces relatively quick changes uh, over fairly large spatial scales. And, and when I say quick here, um, note that I'm still referring quick to a sense in Earth's long term history um, sense. So I'm talking hundreds to thousands of years. Um, where this can change, produce a significant change over Earth's surface, um, which again in, in full Earth history is is quite uh, a short amount of time, you know, but of course in our lifetimes is could be greater than our whole lifetime. So just to make sure, and we're talking in a geologic type of time scale here, of tens to thousands of years is, is a relatively quick time scale. Um, but this quick change is important um, because it also led to the beginning of an event. Uh, when we're really, really, where we're really starting around this 60 to 70 million years ago in terms of climate that happened about that time, uh, this Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum event. Um, I'm not going to go too much in depth to it, but just I'm noting it here because it is, we are, you know, and scientists, I should say, are, are generally interested in this event um, in terms of uh, climate changes of the Earth, mainly because it provides really the best comparison that we can have to present day uh, in the massive kind of influx of carbon dioxide that we're presently also seeing in the atmosphere due to human activity. And we'll get to that here in a few slides. But, um, you know, the, essentially the annual rates even now are probably about 10 to even 100 times greater than they were in emissions uh, during the during that time period of that Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. But um, just to note that, you know, it was um, a, a large in the very really quick, relatively hundreds over hundreds to thousands of years, um, quick rise in carbon dioxide, and that's kind of shown by this little spike here. Um, if we were actually to zoom into it and see that, um, well, just to note that again, that's really you know, an object of study at present, just an in, in interest because uh, of how it kind of acted uh, in its in, in seeing or you know showing off as a way to um, act in this capacity of kind of an analog to present day. So that was one of the ways, again, we can see this very sharp increase in carbon dioxide there and, and kind of tied to that increase in temperature uh, with that Paleo-Eocene thermal maximum. Um, but um, to note that, you know, that's that's one way often we can see this positive feedback in, in that case, particularly in temperature and carbon dioxide increase. Um, but also the second then climate feedback we'll focus on here um, is a negative feedback. Um, and this is termed the carbon dioxide weathering feedback. Um, and so that meaning that, you know, with a negative feedback now, it kind of slows or inhibits um, this you know, a process from occurring. And so this, though, is much relatively slower. Um, this carbon dioxide weathering feedback, usually it's you know, more on kind of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years time scale. Um, and we're, we'll get to weathering in a later part in this uh class in, in a later lecture and lesson, but just to note to you that to what we're referring to here is that carbon dioxide is actually also taken out of the atmosphere um, and stored essentially in rock by a series of weathering processes. Um, and so, but that again acts relatively slowly compared to at times where we saw 
uh, with this payload is in their thermal maximum a, a quite sh a sharp rise or increase in that carbon dioxide that was released um, from some different uh, n natural processes as well. Um, and so, you know, this carbon dioxide and weathering process or feedback eventually moderated the quick temperature rise of that paleo eocene thermal maximum is usually kind of what uh, when we've seen any spikes in the past uh, through different processes um, sometimes to some extent over long these very longer time periods of course um, are bringing that carbon dioxide back down to around in a moderate way so again kind of moving back to this and then now starting to uh, decrease uh, the amount of time uh, we're looking at and kind of moving towards present um, you know, if we actually look at as well, kind of from that past about 70 million years ago and you know, coming towards present, uh, noting that as well, we see, especially when we get into the last few million years, kind of a lot more variability um, within kind of or short, shorter time spans of temperature going up and down, up and down um, in, in terms of climate variability that's associated mainly with the ice albedo feedback, um, but then kind of moderated out as well to some extent by that. Um, carbon dioxide and weathering feedback. So um, note that these changes, and especially to, tied to that ice albedo feedback, um, you know, the, the changes that are actually driving that though are um, tied to some other components, or really, you know, what we term the drivers um, being Earth's orbit of the sun kind of in the degree and tilt uh, of that tilt. And so to, to kind of go into these, so we have, um, you know, actual, the actual tilt. So we've talked about how that at present is about 23.5 degrees. But actually, to note that that does vary over time. Um, we have kind of evidence to show that that's uh, varied anywhere from about 22.1 to 24.5 degrees uh, tilt on its axis um, compared to that plane of the ecliptic. And that varies kind of back and forth over a cycle of about 41,000 years or so. Another uh, change or kind of in, that we have is this direction of Earth's axis and its rotation relative to the stars. So kind of how this how uh, the sun the earth is pointed at different stars at different times um, that changes kind of depending on uh, different gravitational forces exerted by other large bodies or near bodies so the sun being uh, a very large other gravitational pull within our solar system and the moon of course is quite close to us and so that um, these those forces have different impacts in terms of how the, the earth is exactly uh, rotating around uh, and these also vary on a different time scale, about 26,000 years. And then even then we have um, to note that orbits themselves rotate over time as well. So we can see it by shown by this GIF here, how the Earth, um, uh, we have this procession um, and going around in here and, and kind of tied to that, what we also terms the orbital shape or it's an eccentricity. So this eccentricity is essentially a measure of departure from a circular orbit. So if we'd have an eccentricity of zero, if you know we had a perfectly uh, circular orbit and shown by the red here around the sun with Earth. Um, but to note that actually Earth's orbit is a little bit off of that. Um, it's not quite as, as exaggerated. This is actually a very exaggerated, way, way more eccentric uh, um, than we would ever be um, around the sun. But just, just kind of show you to get in your mind to note that there is actually a little bit of difference for this. Um, again, to remind go, going back to, we've talked about this with the aphelion and perihelion, uh, how the sun is a little bit further or closer uh, uh, to, the earth is a little bit closer, further or closer to the sun at any given point uh, in the year. And so that's tied to this idea of that eccentricity. Um, and that varies kind of from just about perfectly circular um, to a little bit more uh, oval um, as we kind of have so maybe a little bit more approximate over here. Can, or again, though, this is very kind of um, exaggerated. But that varies over roughly 100,000 year time scale as well. And so I'm not too worried about you knowing the exact variation of different the time scales on that, but at least knowing uh, these different components and how to some extent you know they are related knowing how they influence uh, you know long these longer term climate changes the earth has gone through I um, mean tied to some of those processes we just went through with the ice albedo feedback and the carbon dioxide weathering feedback so um, and how that then leads us to you know, as we're kind of decreasing in the amount of time we're looking at here now only going from the last 800,000 years to present um, and kind of looking at a graph I guess once again, uh, our time on the right here at well, present to 800,000 years on the left-hand side. And so the vertical axis here is showing temperature change 
um, and also carbon dioxide kind of mapped on top of each other. And so this is showing that really um, through this time period we can see you know, this back and forth with um, both carbon dioxide and temperature and how they really seem to match each other uh, going through time. And also to note how that's in part tied to um, really seeing how most of this time over the past 800,000 years and in the past few million years we've seen actually the earth most of the time being in what we term kind of an ice house or glacial periods. Um, so actually with the, the, quite a bit of extensive coverage of Earth's uh, surfaces um, are all covered by ice um, and it's only really been a few brief relatively brief times of period where we see these uh, what we term interglacial periods or these warmer periods and um, that's actually presently in part what we're in and so I'm um, to know again just how the co2 really follows that um, and you know kind of related how we've already talked about with greenhouse gases um, you know, in their influence in the atmosphere and warming Earth's atmosphere, how those really, you know, are playing off of each other to some extent here. So decreasing further and further is now going to the last 400,000 years. So just to focus on carbon dioxide here, again, as well, you know, noting how really uh, through you know, these processes um, in the past, we've seen kind of this variation, oh, from about uh, 180 to almost up to 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide, really, um, but now how really only within the past 50 to 100 years, seeing this uh, in 150 years at most, um, kind of going back how we've seen this very steep increase, um, you know, exponential even uh, increase and in going way above, you know, now over 400 parts per million um, carbon dioxide at, at our current extent um, and having you know, much, much higher uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than really at any point um, that at least we have any analog for um, in any recent quote unquote um, time history of Earth's um, environment or climates. Um, you know, we have to go millions and millions of years back um, before we would have any type of analog to when uh, that uh, the Earth has had this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and um, the Earth definitely was much, much warmer. Um, as kind of again, we've generally seen this matching of carbon dioxide and temperature. So, um, temperature changes. How is that? You know, how what have we seen kind of tied to with that in the past couple thousand years now? Um, so, seeing in the past two thousand years here, this graph is essentially showing a bunch of those different climate proxies, some of which we talked about at the beginning, at the beginning of this um, video. Um, and so you can you know, read the description of what's actually I'll be showing here. Um, and it's kind of similarly to go to the next graph, um, a very similar one, once again, kind of showing the global climate temperature over, over time. And then our kind of steep, relatively steep increase and rise of that temperature over the past couple hundred years. Um, so really noting that the oldest empirical data that we have, so are things we're actually measuring we're, with thermometers and not relying on some sort of proxy data, really though only cover um, uh, past a uh, couple hundred years at most, so back to the mid 1800s, and so really, and we now go into only the past. Uh, you know, now we're looking at decades of time. Um, we're now seeing, uh, kind of, with our temperature anomaly on the right here, again from about 1880 to present, seeing um, actually how really uh, most of the all the re pa present and recent years have all been above kind of the average over that time period, so which means that really almost every year we're seeing um, continuous more warming. Um, and also tied to that, you know, carbon dioxide, we can see this kind of slow pattern up uh, of these uh, every through year. And again, this being the parts per million over here on the left hand side over time, this slow and steady trend upwards. Um, and really that's tied to, if we actually were to look at this more globally, um, kind of a three major global climate trends. So seeing high latitudes kind of generally warming, warming faster than lower latitudes. You know, seasonally seeing winters generally warming more or faster than summers. Um, and land masses generally heating faster than oceans. So that's kind of tied to some things we already talked about. And you'll see this as well in, your, in the lab that you're completing tied to this module. You'll see some of these aspects as well. Um, just to note how those, you know, that's more recent times. And so again, and even when we saw this CO2 graph, we can kind of note that within that upward trend of, of carbon dioxide over longer, over these time scales, there is seasonal variation. So you can actually see how the, oops, it goes um, up and down here. Um, our uh, carbon dioxide goes up and down kind of through the seasons, the highest values in March or April and lowest values in October 
or November. And so we actually see this yearly trend um, that goes back and forth over time. Um, although kind of as we have a trend here of that increasing over time, we see that um, kind of back and forth more seasonally um, because of where our land masses are. So especially in the mid latitudes, where a lot of trees, you know, and plants and things like that put on um, and grow in the summer months and take in carbon dioxide, essentially reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because it's with you know, the, that, that carbon is being used within the plants. Um, so then, then once they go back to senescing and decaying in you know, the late fall, winter, and spring, that releases that carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And so that's why we get those higher values kind of in the, by the end of winter when a lot of that has been released back into the atmosphere then starts to go back down into the summer months as that's being taken back up again and being used to grow plants. But again, within that trend, you know, of up, uh, seasonally up and down, of course, again, we're seeing this trend continuously upwards um, and see the most recent years here again, where we're now over 400 parts per million. And so um, this really brings us to, you know, I'm, I've kind of shied away at this point so far talking about and there's whole classes, there's, you know, we could spend amazing amount of time there's so much literature out there i'm um, you know, talking about climate change um, and a lot of issues around it in terms of global warming um, and you know even just calling it global warming um, you know in the contention around that in political arenas and you know in a variety of other cultural ways um, and you know if we don't, really what i've just been showing us here is kind of the actual data that has been collected um, and kind of the scientific evidence behind how we term global warming is a phenomenon and you know just note so how do we know though you know when we're talking about you know global climate change and, and global warming why actually we know that people can be termed to be a main cause of this or we could actually call it anthropogenic uh, global warming you know, and, and terming people to be a, a one of the dominant causes of this because you may hear something like okay well climate has always been changing and you know while we just saw earlier through this lecture that while that is true, you know, really what we're saying to the present now is that it's the rate of change that, um, you know, that rate of change is much faster now than it really has been at other, any other period in Earth's history. So as I noted earlier, compared to that um, Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, you know, the, the, the warming or, and, and or excuse me, the, the carbon dioxide emission rate to the atmosphere and the other greenhouse gas em rate emissions to the atmosphere are tens to hundreds of times higher than any kind of natural process we can really ever find in terms of proxy data. Um, and so you know, in, in another way, we essentially by modeling, you know, the warming um, that we would expect to see um, and can tying that to measured data that we find um, in terms of temperature anomalies, for example, as we see on the graph on the bottom of this slide, you know, really we we modeling that does not account for human activities and burning of fossil fuels and release an emission of greenhouse gases um, cannot essentially match observed warming. So what we're seeing here on the bottom here is kind of this blue line that shows you know if we um, didn't take into account any human influence, any you know, emissions um, from human activities, you know that doesn't really match very well compared to this red line, which is again is an estimation, kind of it's, it's a model. Um, but it's it matches much closer to what we've actually measured in terms of temperature anomalies. Um, but that red it's it's only this red line compared to the blue line that actually takes into account human influences. Another thing, you know, another contentious point, or you know, where people might argue with this uh, as humans being a main cause would be something like, yes, but you know, so and so year or you know, this several years period doesn't show that trend of um, you know continuously um, warming or um, you know, not usually used in the case of the carbon dioxide, as we generally can see that trend to go up. You know, but you know, maybe with temperatures, we sometimes we do see kind of individual years um, with a range of anomalies. We can't have you know a colder year than the prior year at times, um, depending on the locality or depending even at a global scale to some extent. Um, but you know, really, when we think about that, of course, we we've talked about weather. Um, we've talked about you know what climate is. It's kind of this longer term aggregation of that weather. Um, and so, you know, when we're thinking about those local conditions and the weather, yes, true, for a year and even perhaps a few years at a time, we may vary from a long-term average trend. But, you know, as we're seeing within our average trends, they are, our temperature is continuing generally to trend upwards and upwards over time. And again, you'll also address that 
in the lab for this week. And so really, you know, this ties back to already concepts we've talked about with greenhouse gases. We know that they re-radiate long wave radiation. We know that, you know, we, we've talked about through that and how that in, must, in, in a sense, then warm Earth. And we've seen that show play out in the actual observational data we've collected across Earth I mean, with many different agencies, um, not only in our country, but really globally. And, you know, we know that greenhouse gases concentrations like carbon dioxide, as I've shown, as well as other greenhouse gases that are generally increasing. And so really the main question is not, you know, uh, is this happening or not, but it's simply how much warming uh, will we experience or can we expect to experience and how quickly will that occur? Um, and so that's kind of the big unknown question going into you know, the future uh, and hopefully, you know, I would say probably most of our lifetimes um, you know, in the question of well, how much temperature change will we see? You know, um, so, the prominent, most group working on this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, I'm um, showing some of their um, information here. And so, kind of, uh, there's a range of different possibilities and scenarios that are shown here down on the bottom. And we're really we're seeing, you know, we're arguing it could be anywhere from uh, on the low end, people will say about two degrees Celsius change, although. Um, you know, that's been a target actually in some of the most recent um, kind of global meetings and, and goals of, uh, you know, with the Paris Accord a few years ago now. Um, and, you know, other more recent meetings, I think it was about two or two and a half degrees Celsius was targeted as the goal. Um, but likely kind of during the future, if you actually look at human activity, probably more on track of somewhere, say, three to six degrees Celsius uh, degrees of warming um, for essentially this century that we're in now, the 21st century. And so we have a, you know, eventually what we're seeing here on the right hand is a variety of these different scenarios and possibilities of how much will we warm and you know, likely based on these different climate scenarios and modeling, you know, where will we see that warming most occurring? Um, and you know, generally following those trends that I talked about a few slides ago, where we're already starting to see more or less uh, change occurring uh, or seasonally um, where more or less when we're starting to see that occur. So just want to bring that um, this information as well tied towards lab this uh, that you'll be working on for this module, moving that forward uh, for this uh, course.